I had two groups when I was like kind of preparing in terms of uh, the two types of patients that I find rewarding. Um, one is the individual. So it was this uh, 30-year-old woman that had come in and she's the advocate. She was searching for a provider to help her with her visual snow, evaluate her, give her options in terms of treatment. And she would go around asking, but everyone would tell her over and over, there's nothing we can do. It's, you know, and so when, when my colleague met her and she asked her, she's like, oh, wait, we do have someone. Let me make an appointment for you. And so from there, um, she was ecstatic. She was just ecstatic that as soon as we did the colorimetry and showed her, she's like, oh, can I take these home? And that's how good she felt, right? And so it would, she didn't even need that much time to even adjust to the lenses. So by far, she's probably my most rewarding because she can't stop talking about how important it is to educate others, how important it is to tell other people with visual snow that there's an evaluation, it, it, it's validated, like, you, you know, it, you're not, it's not in your head. Like, she just keeps wanting to tell people that and tell providers to, you know, learn more about it and, and give your patients hope instead of saying, you know. And so I think that's one um, individual. The group of individuals was um, this group, these young ladies with the POTS that had such a huge improvement just week by week with their NORT therapy. And till this day, my residents enjoy it too. Like each week we're both kind of, all of us are experiencing these, oh, oh, did you hear what this person said? And did you hear what this person said? And, and we're both like celebrating with them. Just their, their each week, um, all the things that they can do now. So we're getting to a place where if they're seen enough, enough times, the insurance will not cover more, a certain number of sessions, right? Right now we're using subjective visual disturbance a lot. And I think it's important also for treatment for them to get insurance coverage. In terms of the next five years and in terms of treatment and management of patients with visual snow syndrome, um, I see just further developing kind of um, categories of patients where it's more specific to kind of their condition. So, a con so recently, let's say as an example, it's um, a condition where the joints are like very hyperflexible. It's called Erlos-Danlos. We've been seeing patients with visual snow, and I'm like, or our visual snow patients say, oh, you know, my doctor wants me to get tested for low stainless. And we're like, really? You know, and so I think um, just having categories of understanding that they're going to have possibly visual snow and then to treat it with that understanding. For me in the next five years and, and solidifying that so that the medical community can be aware, you know, so it's not an isolated thing anymore where it's like, oh, this could actually be part of that condition, um, whether it's concussion syndrome, whether, you know, whatever it is, I've been more excited about understanding that it is associated with other conditions and then to be able to help them. But that for me might help me um, understand, is there a commonality of those conditions, which right now I'm not seeing, but I'm wondering if there is one which would then help with actually helping reduce that visual snow symptom in, in all these conditions. My message to the patients that have visual snow syndrome is to keep advocating for yourself. I think I'm so amazed at my patients that come in, like they're researching, they're reading the literature for themselves, and they're coming and asking for, you know, um, literature, they're asking me to validate some of the literature they read. And so I think that's important. I think especially for children, younger practitioners, like younger teenagers, like the 12 year olds, um, to, you know, believe them when they say they have these symptoms, because they often come to us and say and tell their parents, oh, I didn't know that that was not normal. You know, and we've actually had 20 year olds that said the same to me. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I didn't know that everyone didn't see didn't see the dots on the white walls, you know? And so I think it's very important and, and that word of advocacy and then to keep seeking out, right? To keep seeking out answers. Go, you know, go to Visual Snow Initiative and, you know, become a member and like understand what's going on in the community. Um, 
in terms of pra practitioners, like I really, it's like please understand them, please listen, and then please, um, you know, understand that there's an anxiety underlying, and to you know give them calm, right? Don't don't just um, just don't tell them that oh there's nothing we can do. That just you know help them research um, and look for things to to see if, if things could help them, right? Because um, yeah, they come in with so much anxiety. I think practitioners, um, the first thing we want to do is maybe you know just hand it off to someone else and 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 say it's a mental health condition and it's not. And so just to be able to um, have them validate the individual that's in front of them. Um, I in terms of practitioners, what I would encourage because. It, the, the patients are so relieved when you can validate their symptoms. And I think that relief gives them the ability to trust you, right? And I, so I think uh, it's very important to do that, to understand them, and also to understand that there, there will be an underlying anxiety because of those symptoms, and to be patient with them for that. So, uh, but understand that they're gonna be so relieved when you say that you heard of it, that, oh, you've, you've heard that there might be some treatment for it. And I, you know, I think for them that, that that is something they really would love to hear from you.